Yeah, let me, let me give you a quote that is a representative sample of what virtually all the officially smart people are telling us, whether you go to um, uh, Oxford University did a research, uh, recent study or uh, the Kinsey Group, wh whoever you want to go to, um, they're telling us basically one of two things. I'll give you the dystopian side and the utopian side. So here's the dystopian side, the depressing uh, side of the debate is that sometime in the next five to 20 years, about 50% of all jobs are going to go the way of the dodo bird, uh, wiping out massive industries, wiping out uh, many of the people, especially uh, the jobs that are replaced or disappeared. Uh, those people will never be able to get jobs again. They will suffer from so called technological permanent technological unemployment. Therefore, the government needs to give everybody a universal basic income to pay everyone not to work because there won't be any jobs. So that's the dystopian side. The utopian side says this, sometime in the next five to 20 years, about 50% of all jobs are going to be destroyed and replaced by robots and artificial intelligence. And it's gonna be awesome because we're not gonna have to do anything. We're not gonna have to work. The robots are gonna do it for us. That's the uh, I, I've summarized about 25 books that have been written in the last three years. Uh, and, and if you notice something, they presuppose uh, something. They, they share uh, a fundamental assumption. And it's that machines ultimately are capable of replacing us. It's a great quote from a book I spend a lot of time on in, the, in uh, the Human Advantage called The Rise of the Robots by a guy named... Martin Ford, and here's how he describes the dilemma. He said, the shift now underway will ultimately challenge one of the most basic assumptions about technology, that machines are tools that increase the productivity of workers. Instead, machines themselves are turning into workers. So you might be thinking, like when economists hear this, they say, this is silly to say that technology is gonna permanently uh, replace people's work. No, what, what technology does is if we develop technology that it m sort of increases our capacity and labor, it makes some old way of doing something obsolete. And so if you think about in 1776, 95% of the population lived and worked on farms. And most of those people, I think I had ancestors on both sides that were like this, didn't have a plan B. Right? If you were an American farmer in 1776 and you lost your farm, it's not like, well, I'll go back to school and I'll be an actuarial an analyst or something like that, right? You didn't have a plan B. Um, today, it's approaching 1% of the population lives and works on farms as their sort of primary employment. So does that mean 94% of the population uh, is unemployed? Of course not, uh, because this isn't what happens economically. So what happens is that farming has become so productive that we need very, very few people to actually, actual people to work on it because their labor is so productive uh, from the technology that we've developed. That's brought the price of food way, way down. If you look at how much we spend as a percentage of our income on food, it's at historical lows and continues to get lower. Uh, and so that means we have resources, we have money to spend on other things, and people end up transferring into to other work. Now, the bad news is that lots of jobs do disappear. And so I actually agree that any job that can be automated is going to get automated. That's just, that's a really good rule of thumb. If you're doing something, this isn't just manual labor. Uh, if you're working in a factory and you're doing something really simple and repetitive, um, that's gonna disappear really quickly. If you're doing something in an office that's really, really repetitive, uh, that's just simple kind of number crunching, that could very well be replaced. Now, it do that doesn't mean the job as a whole will be replaced. It will mean that maybe what 20 people were doing, one person will be able to do because they'll be able to outsource stuff. But so does that mean that machines are literally going to turn into workers, as Martin Ford says? Notice that this argument it's not so much an argument as is, is a, a claim based upon a fundamental assumption. A uh, basic sort of truth of logic is for one thing to replace another thing, it has to have all the same properties in common. If we are just machines, if we are, as Marvin Minsky said, if our brains are machines made of wheat, made of meat, not made of wheat. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about <laughs> gluten here. That's even worse. Machines made of wheat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, machines made of meat. Um, yeah, exactly. Then this is, yeah, see, the vegan Marvin Minsky said this, yeah. Um, machines made of meat, if that's true, 
We're just machines. We're produced by this blind Darwinian process, and we become conscious and create things. And there's no reason to assume that machines we design to do thinking won't do that better than we can and then ultimately replace us without remainder so that everything about us can ultimately be, be replaced mentally and then eventually physically through robotics. Now, if you're worried about the robotic side, it's true if you're doing a, re a repetitive thing with your hand. Robots do that really well. If you're doing complicated things with your body that any three-year-old can do, we don't have robots that can do that. So a carpenter or a painter or a welder, there are between five and seven million skilled trade jobs that are not filled right now because people aren't being trained to do that. So that we're not going to have a robot housekeeper anytime soon. That's, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is all the things that can be reduced to algorithms uh, are going to be. So the only question is, that does that leave us with nothing to do? I think absolutely not. What it leads us to do and what it ought to lead us to do is say, OK, what is it that distinguishes us from machines. As economists say, what you want to do if you're thinking, okay, I'm in a competitive environment, I want to figure out what my comparative advantage is, what the thing that I can do relative to my opportunity costs, or my competitive advantage, the thing I can do better than the, the, the competition, and focus on that. We don't want to focus on the things that machines can do. Uh, that, that, that should be obvious. But I mean, this is actually a complaint of all the way from Adam Smith to Karl Marx about some kind of factory work is that if you're doing a very repetitive assembly line type of work, you're actually doing the work of a machine in a sense because it's simple. And so I think that the reality is we need to look at that type of work, uh, especially really simple assembly line work as an artifact of the 20th century that probably will disappear. That's going to lead to massive disruption. And so I think that's actually, that's the issue. I think that's the thing to worry about, not that we have permanent technological unemployment, not that the government should pay everyone, that's a terrible idea, but that the pace of change is so quick that unlike the change from the uh, agricultural to the industrial economy, took place over 150 years, uh, we have entirely new industries come into existence and then become obsolete in five or 10 years. So that means we have to constantly be teaching ourselves and training ourselves with things. Uh, but ultimately, I honestly think that this debate about artificial intelligence and roboticization is a philosophical debate about what is the nature of man and what is the nature of a machine. What is it about the human person that distinguishes us from any machine or any, uh, any algorithm, any, any program? Um, it's a bunch of things, and this is what I talk about in the book. I first talk about, okay, what, what distinguishes the information economy, and then what should we focus on? And I sent, my basic argument, uh, which I, I won't make persuasively, is that the thing that really distinguishes us is a, a capacity for developing virtue. Because if you can develop virtue, that means, first of all, you have first-person subjective experience. You have agency. You have the capacity to choose between alternatives for a purpose. Now, what's virtue? Well, virtue is where you act by an act of the will. You freely say, okay, I'm just going to start showing up on time, right? I'm going to be punctual. And so I, you just do it, right? And you, first, it's difficult. You have to get up early. You have to set the alarm 50 minutes earlier than you would probably have to to be on time. You do that with your body, and it eventually becomes a habit. And then you keep focusing on the habit and it eventually works its way back into you so that you become more than you were before, so that punctuality becomes a part of who you are. That capacity is a capacity that only exists for free persons, for free intelligent agents. And so what we want to do is we want to cultivate the virtues uh, that allow us to prosper and to succeed in an information economy that's highly disruptive, that grows exponentially, that's highly digital, that's ever more connected, and is ever more informational. And the chief virtue that I, that I argue is the one that sets us apart is one that I call creative freedom. And creative freedom is not just the ability to act freely. I can choose if I want vanilla or chocolate ice cream. It's the ability to train and constrain ourselves so that we can do something meaningfully that we could not have otherwise done. So one kind of freedom would be the, the little girl that doesn't know how to read music, sitting down at the piano and freely playing notes, right? She can freely do that. But can, is she free to play Rachmaninoff? 
Is she free to play that really hard movement of Moonlight Sonata that no one plays because it's so darn hard to play? No. She doesn't have that kind of freedom. How would she do it? How would she acquire that kind of freedom? She'd sit her butt down at the bench for 10 years every day, practice her scales, practice her chords, practice the hard sequences, and then maybe after 10 years of constraining herself, she becomes free to do something, to create something meaningfully that she could not have created before. That's a capacity that is uniquely human. And insofar as creative freedom is the origin of new kinds of meaningful information, I think we actually ought to be more hopeful than worried that in an information economy, there will be a place in which the human person is at the very center. Thank you very much.